Welcome to ACX University. ACX was founded with the goal of democratizing audiobook creation, and we started ACX University to give creators not just access, but the tools and resources they would need to find success in this industry. We believe the next step in that mission is helping to make space for every type of voice within the community to thrive. Even in an industry based on vocal performance, there are still ways in which a person's identity can affect their career journey and opportunities for success. Bias, even when unintentional, exists, and it impacts many independent authors, narrators, and producers. But it's not something we've talked about here in this space. So today, we're going to change that by discussing a topic that's a little different and a little more challenging than our usual fare. We invite you to learn along with us as we aim to make our space more inclusive for all storytellers. So let's meet our first few creators we'll be speaking with today. Hello, my name is Terrell Harrell. Um, I guess if you're up north, it's Terrell Harrell. My family always says that, so I have to say that. Um, I've been in the industry for a little over 10 years, um, working as a producer, an engineer, director. Um, right now, my main focus is as a producer and director. Um, I am the owner of Tida Studios. Uh, we are located in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's a team of about 11 of us cranking out audiobooks for the whole industry as a whole through ACX and other means. Hi, I'm Ebony Flowers. I am an audiobook narrator. I um, have been narrating for about two years. Just before the shutdown, I booked my first book. And um, it's been a wonderful release, a uh, great um, outlet, and I've learned so much in this time. Um, some of my wonderful co-panelists have been great at um, giving me advice and um, guidance along the way. And I mostly narrate black romance, and I'm uh, looking forward to this very exciting conversation with you folks. Hi, my name is Jacqueline. Um, most people in the industry know me as Jock, so that's <laughs> that's the best way to refer to me as. I am the owner and founder of The Audio Flow. I started in this business about four years ago, uh, actually as a podcaster, um, where I would chat with narrators and authors and thought that I felt there was a better way that I could be more involved in the industry and went into production and then went into publishing. So um, last year I decided that I wanted to do something to be more involved with the DEI initiative and I created my third imprint Nubian Audio which focuses on black stories written and performed by, um, by persons of color and so we've been around a little over a year under that imprint and kind of what I what my goal is is to share stories um, that people have that may not have been picked up by large publishers or who may be afraid to jump head first into audio so it is my goal to help them and guide them along the way to create successful audiobooks that listeners will enjoy. Um, and so that's that's our story. We work with everyone and we um, produce every genre. So no genre is left unturned. I'm Crystal Perkins. I have been writing since 2014. Um, I was a bookseller for a lot of years and everyone always told me to write a book and I didn't. And then one day I just sat down and did it and 50 books later, um, here I am. So I mostly write contemporary romance, although I have some paranormal, um, a YA book, and then some female spies. And I also am in some horror anthologies as well. And I just try to write the kind of books I want to read and try to represent my friends and family. So my name is Catherine Nolan. I have been writing contemporary romance, romantic suspense, and romantic comedies since September 2016. Um, I am really a, a huge proponent of the romance genre, uh, the fact that it's a genre that I think is revolutionary, um, I think it's really radical, the way that we prioritize happily ever afters and who, um, who gets a happily ever after and the way that we can see that change on the page also transform our communities. And I'm just always really grateful to be part of this community, 
part of a community that celebrates love in all of its forms and experiences that reflect the world around us. So I'm joined now by Ebony, Terrell, and Jacqueline. Um, thank you all for taking the time to have these conversations with us today. Um, so I want to start by asking, uh, how does racial bias impact your audiobook career? And how has it shaped your experiences as a creator in this industry? Um, Ebony, let's start with you. Um, it's a great question. I'm, again, relatively new to the industry, so I'm still learning a lot in terms of um, where representation is lacking and where um, what efforts are being made in that regard. But what I can say is that, um, you know, because I've done mostly black romance and have not had very many opportunities to um, narrate for white authors um, because of, I guess, my cultural representation or, you know, the reception of the audience or um, whatever the case may be, it can feel like you're being kind of pigeonholed into um, a niche, which I'm very happy to be a part of. I love the Black romance community and, you know, folks are so supportive and, you know, will read everything that you narrate. But as an artist, you want to grow, you know, you want the opportunities to do everything. So um, feeling like you're being limited by forces that are, you know, outside of your control can feel just kind of disempowering. So, yeah. What is it specifically that makes you feel that you're limited? Um, is it that you've auditioned for things? Um, that were maybe non-racial specific or that weren't in black romance specifically and you, you just really had a strong feeling that there was a racial component to not getting cast or, you know, what is it that tells you that, that this is, this is a, a race-based issue? Yeah, it's, it's all of that. It's definitely auditioning for um, books that, you know, seem more mainstream um, and are not in the kind of romance or fiction arena um, and not hearing back about them or not, you know, you nor your, my, me nor my friends having chances at those books. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and unfortunately it becomes a thing where it's just like, like, you know, getting excited about an opportunity, like a big book and then Womp, 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 you know, not having the, the chance to do it and knowing that, you know, you're kind of out before you even get in the door. It's, it's really, you know, tough. Yeah, unfair specifically is, is the word that comes to mind, which I think is, okay. is something that we're, you know, we're, we're covering a lot today. And, and I'm just curious, you talk about being in the black romance space and, and how much you love that and respect that genre. Um, are did you go towards that space because you weren't getting the other opportunities elsewhere? Was that a space that naturally felt right to you, regardless of of other opportunities you weren't getting? Uh, were you you know were you forced into that, or or was it a, a different way? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of it's you know it's kind of like walking into a room as a black person and seeing the other black person in the room and having a moment of like, what's up? You know what I mean? Like, you know the spaces where you're um, embraced and you kind of go where you're celebrated. Um, you know, having audition after audition um, that weren't, you know, weren't booked or I didn't get anything back from just seems like, well, let me go where the work is and let me go where the people are excited about me and let me go where folks are you know inboxing me about you know how, what great job i did on this or that project and and staying there is a byproduct of like a lack of opportunities in other places but also a celebration of like what i do bring to the table it feels good to be you know lifted up somewhere <laughs> you know and why not in a space that's like home for me. Terrell and Jacqueline, I know that you, you have experience from the casting side, um, probably, you know, being the go-between between, between these, these authors and these narrators. Um, can you talk a little bit about, in your experience, 
how these biases show up and what your experience of this bias has been. I would love to piggyback a little bit off of what, off of what Ebony was speaking about, because as I said before, I've been in the industry for 10 years. Um, I've been freelance and then going into my own company for the past five. And I can say that I've never been hired to cast a non black title. Um, this has never even come up. And when I say I've worked with every, every publisher on the planet and I've worked with all the big names and we still haven't had the opportunity to actually cast somebody. We've done full production, but we've never, they never go, Oh yeah, let me see your roster because it's just assumed that when we cast a title, we only have black people on our roster, I guess. Is that's what I that's the only thing I can think of. I mean, that's where I see it a lot. Um, and then more because I obviously on the producer side more to do with um infrastructure. So to do these books and to do them at a high level it requires a certain level of infrastructure. But it always seemed that we had to have more infrastructure than my peers um, to actually be able to produce certain books. So, yeah, I, I would say it's definitely there. I would say that it's probably not malicious in as far as intent, but it also is one of those things where when you call someone out on it, they are quick to say, oh, no, but I really don't do that. And that's when it's like, oh, okay, but yeah, you do. That's why I'm saying it to you. Uh, so Tyrell, just to make sure everybody understands, what do you mean by infrastructure uh, in, in the context you were just using it? Um, I mean, as far as staff, um, resources, and technology capabilities. That's super interesting. And, you know, we fast forward to now where, where I'm hearing that you have, uh, you know, carved out something of a niche. Um, you do have um, a lane is what I think I'm getting where people are contacting you and, um, you know, you, you are saying that it, it is predominantly um, for, for black literature, for black roles, uh, black, uh, you know, casting, things like that. And I'm just curious, you know, for people out there that, that may not understand the significance of that, um, you know, in the audiobook industry, uh, plenty of people are happy to have a lane, right? If, if you're known as the sci-fi person, um, some people are really happy with that because they know they're going to get called for those sci-fi books. Um, it can be hard to establish a foothold in the industry and, um, you know, to be thought of by anybody for anything. Um, so uh, I'm just curious, why does it feel problematic? Why doesn't it feel okay that you have a niche, you have a lane, um, but it's, it's based on your, your identity, your, your, your race. Why, why is that wrong? Niches don't work for production companies. So the fact that we only have, or not because we don't only have black projects, right? It's just that is the vast majority. And for the longest time, it was the only thing. Um, it doesn't work because it doesn't allow us to scale at the rate of our competitors. Right. So if anybody knows audiobook, the audiobook industry, the rates are pretty much set. Like you can go lower, which is bad, but you can't really go higher. And the only way to actually make money in the industry as a production company and to be able to afford raises and health care for employees and things of that nature, you have to be able to scale. So if you're only limited to a certain genre, it, it hurts your ability to scale and then you lose good talent because that talent's going to now go to try to work for a publisher or like some other entity that can pay them six figures and do whatever. Right. Like, so that's, that's like the crux of it for us. Um, because we have the capacity and the capability to handle as much as any of the big houses. And we actually do. I mean, I will say it has been, phenomenal, a phenomenal year, um, where we have been able to do a wide range of diverse work that we have not been able to do in the past. Like this year specifically has been great. Um, but again, I've been speaking historically 
And then again, I'm speaking to like the growth potential. So let's say what Ebony was speaking about before. So she's saying that she's getting cast, typecast at this point. So if we're getting that book that is a tweener book, and I don't mean age, I mean it could be, or I guess ambiguous is a better word. If we get that ambiguous book, we are able to send that audition out to Ebony. And we're also able to not have her cover photo. And we're also able to like do certain things to make sure they just know that, okay, this could be the voice, right? Um, and as far, as long as we're not a part of that process, um, then they're not going to get the opportunity. Like the Ebony's of the world won't get that opportunity. So when you say not send her cover photo, that leads into another question I have, oh, yeah. which is, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, how much are, are you sort of, uh, obscuring or disguising race or ethnicity to like book certain jobs? Cause I've heard, I've heard authors on the author side, you know, using a pseudonym, um, uh, to, to sort of obscure that for certain audiences, um, or, uh, using book covers maybe that don't feature black cover models, um, for that reason. Is that, is that a factor? Um, I would say so. Um, I would yeah. like, even we have a roster, right? We have a roster. And if you go on our online roster, you can see like the faces of everybody, their bio, who they were, where their accent was, all that stuff. But if someone's reaching out to us and they're saying, Hey, can you cast a book? Can you send us a sample? I'm only going to send the voices. I'm not even going to send, I'll send like, this is narrator one, this is narrator two, narrator three. So they can't even use the name as a, Oh, well, I'm not going to use Reynard versus Josh, even though Reynard actually is from America and Josh is from Europe and is using a fake American accent. And you don't even know that. Well, so you see what I mean? So like, it just doesn't make, to us, it makes sense because we're thinking about it because we have to think about it. But if you don't have to think about it, I guess that's where you fall into that trap. And again, it's, it's that extra layer of stress and anxiety and effort that you have to layer on top of just the stress of producing and going out and finding work and stuff like that. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's, again, it's just, and as you said, in this industry, as you're constantly trying to take on more work, the more effort you have to put into getting more work, you're just farther behind the eight ball. You're just, you know, you're doing twice as much work as the next studio down the street, um, you know, to get the same amount of work, let alone try to grow. So that definitely sounds really tough. Um, Jacqueline, I'm curious how, uh, you know, your experience lines up with what we've heard from Ebony and Terrell. Um, have you faced similar challenges, different challenges? I was in a situation in a meeting and uh, you know how Ty said he gets a lot of work and it's specifically directed toward black audiobooks and he's only been given those from large publishers. Um, uh, we have not had an opportunity to do that. And while I was in a meeting uh, with several persons, they mentioned that they only knew one black production house, which was Ty Dev Productions. And during that meeting, I said, I'm sitting right here and I also produce audiobooks. Um, and I, and I said, and I'm black and I did like this in the meeting. Um, and that gives, it, it made me feel, um, like I wasn't seen or heard. And you, you will hear that a lot where people will say, I see you are here. You hear that a lot from people who consider themselves allies. And these were people that I have been interacting with for at least one and a half to two years. I do want to piggyback a little bit on what Ebony mentioned earlier about being typecast. I want to use Ebony for an example. Hopefully this is okay. Um, sometimes I don't do auditions. I'll just have in my head, I want to hire this person because I know what their skill set is. Honestly, I didn't know Ebony could speak French or get past it enough for what it is she did in this last book that we just did. And it takes a uh, place, part of it in Paris. And I was just like, Ebony, I just want you to, 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 to read this for me so I can send it to the author. And I would have thought she studied in France somewhere. I, I didn't know. So the thing is, giving opportunity, yes, they're going to, we want them for this title. But there are some other characters in there where they actually have to 
perform outside of what that authentic voice is. So these are things that we look at for me as a casting director or producer or whatever hat you know we're wearing that day to say yes ebony did a really good french accent in this book and it wasn't just two lines so now i know if something else comes up that's outside of nubian audio i know she can get she can do a french dialogue even if it's in a multicast and i just want to put her voice in there Emily, you mentioned about pen names. I didn't even show, used to show my face when I first started because I didn't think it was important. It was, I can do the job and here's my logo. <laughs> I, I, nobody needed to know what I look like and it wasn't just until recently that I started exposing myself more and putting myself out there. Yeah, it seems like it must be really difficult to um, make that negotiation. It seems like it must be a really tough line to walk to want to put your face out there associated with the work you're doing to show, you know, this is who I am and this is what I'm capable of. And to get that representation out into the world as a black creator. Um, but, you know, knowing that that could potentially be detrimental to your career and to the opportunities that you're given in the future. And ultimately, I mean, it isn't your responsibility to mm -hmm. hide who you are to get better work. It's the industry's responsibility to yes. be better um, about hiring people based on mm -hmm. their merits, based on what they're Agreed. able to do. I can want to, can I just, I don't yeah. mean to interrupt, but like, yeah. To say that it's the industry, I just feel like that also works too as the cop out. It's like the people in leadership, the people that are in charge. Yeah, right. We yeah. there's a very small industry. It's a very small industry, right? Mm -hmm. So to say it's the industry is easy to just say, oh well, yeah, that casting director totally should be looking. No, it's the people that say, all right, who's cutting the checks? How many books are we producing this quarter? All right, um, this last year we had 25 percent, which is I would say very high and probably not true. We had 25% of diverse um, narration in our work last year. What are we going to do to get it to 50 this year? Or what are we going to do to make it more even? You know, we have to have that direct conversation because otherwise it's just like somebody passing the buck on to somebody else. And that's still considered no, yeah. the yeah. industry. It's the industry as a whole. So it's not, it's, it's basically not just one person who's a part of the audiobook process. It's all of us. Uh, and and it's making those connections to say this is what needs to happen. I, I want to bring up a, a point that Ty made at an event we went to before, and he said, um, why is it up to us to create diversity or something like that? Why is it up to... I'm going to discuss the black people <laughs> in the room to go out there and say, you guys need to be more diverse and we're going to do all of this stuff to make it diverse when it's not us and we're doing all the work. So I think that was one thing he, one of many things that he said that just makes a lot of sense is that other people do need to be involved in figuring out this is where we err. And this is where we need to make up for it. And this is what how we need to go about doing that. And and we, a lot of things are lip service and you don't get it. You don't see it put into action until they involve us. And then we're going to carry it on. So. Well, you know, you, you call on something really interesting that I think allows us to pivot to bring in. Um, you know, a couple of rights holders that are going to join us today that um, are, are allies in this mission uh, that we're all talking about to create a more inclusive space. Um, and, and I do agree with what both of you were saying. What I find really interesting is Tyrell talked about or, or defined a really specific kind of intent, um, not just who it comes from, right, leadership, but um, putting numbers around it, being specific and not just saying we should involve more diverse voices, but saying, OK, this year. And frankly, this is how it's done for any other part of the business. And so why can't it be done for this? OK, here's what we did this year. Here's our goal for where we'd like to get next year. How do we grow from A to B with specific tactics to get there? Um, which is, I think, really important to call out because if that's how you're going to look at how many books you produce, if that's how you look at how much your profit margins are going to grow, if a more inclusive space is important to your business, 
you have to define it in the same way you define the other goals for your business. And so I'm really glad you called that out. Good point. And, and something, um, you know, Jacqueline said that I thought was really important is this, like, why should it be on, um, the burden of changing the industry? You know, when we talk about the industry needs to change, first of all, you know, Terrell saying that, like, it's, it's too vague to say the industry needs to change is a great point because it's like that, that deflection of responsibility is what allows these problems to continue is that if we say things like, oh, the world needs to change the industry as a whole, we are not taking personal responsibility. We're not, you know, we're not saying like who needs to do the work and who needs to change. All right. So um, we have Catherine and Crystal here who are both authors. Thank you both so much for, for joining us today. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you to is uh, I think a lot of uh, one thing that can be a major impediment to people actually doing the work and getting started is this fear of getting it wrong um, and not not knowing what like actionable thing to do to start and, and feeling like they're going to do or say the wrong thing. How did you get over that initial fear of getting it wrong to start being an active ally? Um, Crystal, let's start with you. Um, I don't think you get over that fear. We all say and do things that are wrong. It's just important that you try and um, research though, talk to your friends, talk to people you know, look things up, read articles, inform yourself. But also if you do make a mistake, then you need to own that mistake. Um, it's nat second nature to, you know, jump to your defense and be defensive about things. And it's, you just have to take a breath and say, okay, I, I messed up. I need to apologize and I need to go back and learn to do better and listen to the people who are telling you that you didn't do the right thing. Oh, well, absolutely. I would agree with Crystal. I think, you know, so much harm um, has occurred that I think when folks are first thinking, that, you know, it's, I think it's natural to say, you know, I would never want to perpetuate harm or perpetuate that cycle. So maybe I'll just stay quiet or stay silent. But I think, you know, I think what we know is that, you know, individual instances of, of harm and racism are, um, can be traumatic and terrifying and awful. Um, the person who has committed that act, you know, needs to take accountability and apologize. But then, like, collectively, like, white supremacy as a system, you know, is also more than just, you know, individual acts. It's whole systems that need to be kind of, like, torn down and destroyed. And so I think for folks, when they recognize that their individual acts have power, but also collectively we have the power to, like, create a new world that's better, I think it helps you focus on the macro problem and not just, like, you know, I think I said the wrong thing and I hurt some people's feelings, so I'm going to get defensive and actually opt out and decide not to participate anymore. I, I totally understand that instinct. I think it's, you know, like Crystal said, human nature because you feel like you hurt someone and you did. Owning it, recommitting, educating yourself, listening to the person who is, like, sharing their lived experiences and honoring the story they're telling you, um, respecting it. And then just like kind of like moving forward and putting your ego in the back seat and knowing that the goal is so much bigger than um, than your ego in that instance. And I'd add, I think it's more important to speak up than to stay silent because you're afraid to, that you're going to say the wrong thing because too many people stay silent and it's the pe we have to speak up. I mean, it's the people who look like us who make all the powerful decisions that run the world basically. So we need to speak up. And if you get it wrong, then like we said, you, you know, you pivot from there and learn from it, but we have to speak up. And, and I think it can also be helpful to remember that uh, whatever friction you might face by saying the wrong thing or whatever uh, negative feeling that you might have for possibly offending somebody or something, I'm sure that that experience you're having is a fraction of um, the real difficulties that are faced by the people that we're trying to help, um, some of the challenges we've already talked about here. So keeping things in perspective is, is probably also a really helpful way to stay active and not get discouraged as well, um, just to, to be able to keep being helpful. Right, and because oftentimes I think if you are being corrected, like the person who is correcting you is already undergoing something pretty intense to say, hey, that actually really hurt me for these reasons. The person correcting you is already in a very vulnerable position. So I think like for you to receive that and to immediately get on the defensive, you know, they're already giving you something, you know, they're already sharing a part of themselves to kind of say, well, that wasn't, that wasn't me. That's not me. I'm not racist. And then to kind of opt out, you're kind of leaving the other person hanging because they're sharing something that was, um, that's generally speaking, uh, 
pretty intense and also a burden. Yeah. And two, something that, that came up when you were talking about the difference between like the, like, um, like the individual and the, the system is that like, because these problems are systemic, it's not a choice between like, um, not doing, not getting involved and therefore not doing any harm and getting involved and possibly doing harm. It's like, you know, these things are happening, whether you're speaking up about them or not. Um, and so you don't avoid harm by saying nothing. And so as we, as we talk about taking that first step and getting out there and doing something, um, I'm, I'm curious, Catherine and Crystal, like, what was that first step? How, how did you, uh, you know, as we said, get over that fear? What sort of things were you initially putting into action um, to make things better, to make uh, the audiobook space or, or your author space or wherever it might be more inclusive? Crystal, do you want to go first? Um, okay. <laughs> so I've always been a big reader, um, always. I've, and I don't know that it was intentional that I re started reading more diverse books. I just read good books. And um, there's a lot of talk about how people can't relate to this book or that book. Well, there's not many books that write about 50 year old grandmas who are short and, you know, not so thin, but I can relate to those books. So why not read other books, open your mind. And so I did that, but I always post what I'm reading. Um, I was a bookseller first. And so I'm more known for that than sometimes than being an author. So I use my voice as a reader to always post every month what I've read, you know, shout out the books I love. And you know, those just happen to be, a lot of them happen to be diverse books. And so that's, it's really just getting it out there and talking about books and talking about authors you love and reminding people that it doesn't matter what color or what race or religion the characters are. A good book is a good book. And you, you can relate to anything if you really read a book. I do also participate in Autumn Malone has her brown nipple challenge and she'd ask for authors to join in with her. So every month, um, I talk about a diverse book I'm reading and I actually have my roommate read the book and then we get on Instagram and talk to the uh, author, a BIPOC author about their book. So Catherine, for you, um, what were some of the first steps that you took to try to put some of these feelings that you talked about into action and try to affect change? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think a lot of times like last year, um, just to use like last summer as an example, so conversations about racism and romance um, have been happening for decades. Um, but to use last year as one example, a place that was really visible was social media. Um, there are a lot of like black authors, black readers talking about their experiences, talking about Black Lives Matter, police brutality, you know, state surveillance, you know, things that were really important to them. And so from those conversations, like those folks did not need to like give actionable items to white authors, but many folks did. They, you know, they offered up like, if you have questions on how to be a better ally to me in this moment, to our community, you know, which is full of implicit bias and full of racism. Um, here are some key things to do. And Crystal hit on like so many of them. It was, are you using your platform to amplify love stories that look different from the ones that you write, to amplify authors that look different from you? Um, are you financially investing in those authors if you can? Um, you know, doing giveaways, helping with ads, um, putting them in your you know newsletter, doing interviews, because I think you know, for in the romance community. And, you know, I, I've said this to my readers often because I think sometimes uh, white readers may think of, um, I'm going to say politics here, um, kind of uh, ironically, as existing outside of the space of happily ever afters. And yet it, it um, informs every single thing that we do, what we read, who we think deserves a happily ever after, um, who we think deserves joy, you know, sexuality, beauty, those things. Um, Kind of influence every single story that gets promoted and consumed and so readers will be like well it doesn't matter to me i just read whatever and that's not necessarily true because we know of implicit bias that we all have and so i think you know when those action items were kind of like listed out i was able to see the way that i personally had not been doing a very good job of reading more diversely and then my responsibility to share that with my readers because i could see readers you know start to make that connection and I could recognize the fact that like so many of us had not been doing that as part of our responsibility. And um, I think that it really goes far in making sure that like it's not just the love stories of like white cisgender straight people that are always promoted um, 
and goes much further to make sure that the love stories that actually represent the world are what readers are are like buying, promoting, reviewing, you know, so not just like buying and showing it, but like buying it, talking to folks, reviewing it, you know, making sure that all of the other um, privileges that white authors automatically get with their books, every other person is getting those same privileges. And oftentimes that's a lot of financial investment and, and marketing that gets that like is missing for a lot of authors that they feel like they don't have the same access to, which is you know grossly unfair. I would like to say, I think that a lot of self-published or hybrid publishers um, are really taking initiatives to be more inclusive in their writing. It used to be kind of taboo. Oh, I can't write about a black character. Or I can't write about uh, an Asian character. Um, well, you can. Um, and Crystal made a good point about research. Um, you have people, you have people in your community that fit those uh, backgrounds, and uh, and we're again American. Uh, you know, they just happen to have a background from a a different race. Um, you can ask questions. I acquired a book last year. I won't give the name, but it was written. It has a a really pretty black woman on the front with dreads and you would think some black author wrote the book and it wasn't it was a white author who wrote this book and the book dealt direct it was written in 2019 at the height of all of these different things that were taking place as it relates to race and um and, and murders and just hatred and that's how i looked at a version of allyship was telling this diverse story that everybody could relate to and it wasn't your normal romance book because it showed a lot of stuff that happened in there that we could relate that everybody could relate to because of what was happening in our country and I was like thank you um, when I go and look at the reviews I see that people from all backgrounds are like I normally wouldn't read something like this but it was really told well or I'll see a person of color who say, I normally wouldn't have read this book because how could she, you know, be able to tell, but she wrote it so well. And so I just applaud things like that because it's taking a, a, a step out there and saying, I'm trying to represent everybody and I'm going to do research so I can still tell this story authentically. But then it's up to us to make sure we get the right people in place that can carry over and complete telling the story that has been written. Jock, you said a word right there. <laughs> you said a word right can there. Can we say amen because, now? No. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Let's try to say amen. Because honestly, the whole that's that's really where it boils down to. Like think about it. I mean, if you're thinking from a non white perspective Anybody that is working in a white world that is not white has to learn, adapt, research, mm -hmm. study. And we do all this and we do it fairly quickly because if we don't, we're out. Right. We don't get the job. We don't get the whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's like it's incumbent upon you as a white person or a person without color to sit and say, hey, how do I make myself fit into these worlds? Mm -hmm. Like, stop thinking about how we can fit into your world and how we can, like, just go and do the research. That's, that's an excellent example. Like, go do the research. Go do the work. And it doesn't need to take 10 years because, mm -hmm. you know, we have to figure out how to do it in a week mm -hmm. or a couple of days. Yeah. So go and figure it out. I was just going to uh, chime in on a white uh writer reached out to me and offered me her book and um, she went on to explain that she had initially narrated the heroine in the book but she wrote a black heroine all of her books that she had done that with which at the time I think was like three um, re-recorded so she wanted to redo all of her books with um, black narrators and I just thought like that was the first time that it happened to me and um, and like it's beautiful to be in this space and be new in this world and see that there is a lot of work that is happening, be it um, because of the, you know, BLM 
movement and and the propelling forward of the dialogue that that's brought on um, all of in across industries but just to know that you know the conversations are being had and that there is um, some intentionality going on um, it's it's really encouraging in in that way but you know that's one writer you know what I mean these are you know individual acts you know how do we continue to you know expand that work and and make it consistent one of the things that I've heard a lot like in this conversation but also in in other conversations with um with black authors is that they are uh not getting like white readership or right white listenership in their audiobooks because white readers and listeners are like not seeing themselves represented either in the cover models or like in the the characters in the book and they're like well I can't I can't relate to that I don't fit in in that world that story is not about me it doesn't represent me I won't be able to relate and it's so interesting like the other side of that is like the whole like Terrell what you were saying is like the whole world is like it's like a white world and people of color have to like bend themselves into this shape to fit into that whole, that world and that white readers and listening audiences are struggling to, you know, learn or expand their mind enough to imagine themselves in a book, in a story, in a narrative. It's the epitome of the definition of white privilege. Like the idea that you have the option to read or not read you know, to watch or not watch, to participate in or not participate in black, brown spaces. And we don't have that option. It's not optional for me to have grown up without having to, you know, read the Judy Blooms. And I think that that is activism, you know, like Crystal was raised to make yourself sit down and say, how can I connect with this experience? Like, how can I understand something that I might not normally lean to? Um, yeah. I, I think Ebony touched on something that connects really nicely with something that Catherine said at the beginning, um, which leads to my next question. So we can kind of like connect all those dots there. I like when that happens. Um, you know, uh, Catherine raised the idea of um, trying to put at the forefront some diverse voices, diverse books, diverse narrators with uh, her audience. And um, if I remember correctly, uh, potentially getting some feedback that you're injecting politics into the books um, or, you know, into our social media relationship. Um, that's that's privilege to view um, a, a discussion about race or to view the highlighting of a black author as injecting politics. That is that is a really privileged point of view that could only come from somebody who gets to ignore politics 99 percent of the time. And what I'm hearing from uh, you know a lot of our panelists of color is that um, that's that's life. That's not politics. That's day to day, moment to moment, always kind of running through the ticker of of, of your brain. And so it highlights some of the difficulty um, in convincing people or highlighting to people um, you know a diverse view of authors and narrators and stuff. So finally, it leads to my question, which is um, for Catherine and Crystal. Have you had pushback when you try to make your spaces more diverse? Have you had experiences where people weren't quite as willing to pick up on what you were putting down? And if so, how did you push past that? Were you able to continue that mission that you consider so important? Yeah, I am. Um, it's a, it's something that's really, it's a, a personal thing that's really infuriating for me to have folks who, like if you were... If your human rights and your core personhood is not currently being debated at a ballot box or in the Supreme Court, um, aka politics, then you must live a, a beautiful privileged life where you don't have to think about anything except your, your I guess, core safety and the way that you move through, through spaces. Um, it, it bothers me so much that for some reason, creators, artists, creative people, athletes, uh, authors, musicians, celebrities, um, if you're a creative person and you're a storyteller, of course, when things are happening in the world, you're going to do creative things about them. I would hope that like, if you're a creative person, we're all on board with making the world a better place. Uh, there's some rule that 
people believe in, because I'll get DMs that are like, um, just so you know, um, artists aren't supposed to have politics on their feed, or I don't want to read your political views in your books that I'm buying. And I'm not sure like who invented this rule or like uh, what it came from. Uh, it's interesting that the folks who are reaching out to me are often upset about things that would, that like a person who is maybe like a white person not looking outside their privilege is viewing as quote politics, um, not the everyday life of folks who maybe look different from them. And I think if you are part of the dominant culture or dominant narrative, I think it's like really hurtful and harmful to ev everyone and the world for you to believe that everything must continue to be about you at all times, every story, every narrative on television, every billboard, every commercial. And it like, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm getting like a little worked up, but it, it really is infuriating to me to have folks slide in my emails and to ask me why I think that I sh should talk about real life issues. So I'm curious to make it yeah. actionable. What is it yeah. that, what do you do in those cases? And Crystal, yeah. you can chime in as well. Like, yeah. how do you deal with that? Do you push back against it? Do you just let it slide by? Like, you're clearly passionate about that being the wrong attitude, but how do you help change your fans' and listeners' minds? My standard answer is that my humanity is not for sale. So if someone feels they don't need to read my book because they don't like that I speak up about Black Lives Matter or about other issues, then they don't need to read my books. I mean... I, yes, I'm an author, and yes, I want to sell books, but not at the cost of my humanity or of staying quiet over things that people shouldn't be staying quiet over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Like, sometimes it depends on the, the if I can perceive the person is asking me a question and they're curious and listening. So sometimes I'll have, like, boilerplate that I'll send back where I'll be like, you know, thank you for asking these questions that you noticed, you know, here's you know, here's what my, my thinking process was, here's what I read, I would encourage you to read this. And sometimes folks write back and they're grateful. It's, a, it's not very often. And so then I understand that maybe they were just, they're not curious about learning more. Um, comments that are like straight comments on social media sometimes. I mean, sometimes you can tell a person isn't entering into a space um, in a way that's safe for anyone to really interact with them. And so sometimes I obviously block people or I just don't respond. But I think sometimes the only thing you can do is just to keep going and then readers will leave and that's totally fine. And you'll just keep doing the work that you need to do, make mistakes, you know, learn, keep going. One of the things you mentioned was resources, like things that you would point people towards. Um, like what are, the, what are the resources that you're using to educate yourself? You know, we talk, we talk about like, how the burden of education shouldn't be on the people of color around you to like tell, you know, tell you what you're constantly, what you're doing wrong, what you need to be doing better, like what, what actions you need to be doing. Um, what are the resources that you're using and like, where would you point people who want to start acting? Yeah, that's a great question. Sometimes I'll give folks a list of like books I've read on like anti-racism or, um, documentaries, uh, just different authors that I've been like reading. Um, I think a lot of times, like if folks are asking that question, they are really curious. Um, but I think it's like anything else and that this has kind of been touched on by everyone here is that it's not just like, oh, I read one book. I'm now an expert. Um, I like solved racism or whatever. And so I think sometimes folks may be asking for that because they want a simple solution um, yeah. to solve a big problem. But a lot of times, like, I just try to end the conversation with, you know, here's some books I've really enjoyed. You know, you can get involved in your community, keep learning, keep listening. Um, and it's like a long process. But uh, yeah, I think sometimes like folks are like, I read one book, you know. Did it. Done. Yeah, yeah there's books. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what Crystal has. About. Yeah, I was just going to say same yeah. thing. There's great books out there, but also following certain social media accounts that are social justice accounts um, that are, you know, keeping you informed. Sometimes there's free trainings listed on those. And no one thing is going to make you an expert. None of us are experts. But the more you learn, the better informed you are and the better you can make these choices and make the right choices and know what the right things to do and say are. Like we said, it's not going to be 100%, but the more you learn, the better you're going to be. We talked a bit with uh, Crystal and Catherine uh, about how we talk to our fans about this, um, listeners, readers, uh, what's involved with that. And um, we also covered in, earlier in the episode how this plays into casting and um, you know producing audiobooks. 
Um, I'm curious from the author's perspective, um, how do the intentions that you've mentioned here and um, you know, the, the way you're trying to affect change, have you had opportunities to put that into practice with your own work, with your own writing, with your own audiobook casting? So I think that there've been such great discussions about the use of sensitivity readers when you're writing your story. And so um, I have written uh, you know, diverse main characters, but right now I'm trying to really focus on you know, amplifying other authors and then writing diverse like side characters and making sure that my world looks, you know, is diverse. But I, there's also always really good conversations when you do that, because sometimes then you're constantly casting folks in like, you know, they'll call it like the black best friend role or like where, um, only white folks are ever the main character of any story. I've really learned a lot that like sensitivity readers are helpful at all parts because, you know, your side characters in order to not be seen as, you know, uh, archetypes or disrespectful, just like your main characters should have beats to the story, should be well-rounded, should not be seen as just, you know, the person who helps the main characters discover their dreams, but actually have their own story, their own presence. All of that, like, makes it so that it's more of, like, an informed representation. These are all things that sensitivity readers have really helped show me in my own work when I'm not doing a really good job of that. So, Catherine, I think I'm picking it up from the context, but just for anybody out there that's not familiar with the term, what is a sensitivity reader? And just really quickly, like, how can you go and find one? Oh, good question. Uh, sensitivity readers are folks who will work with you on, you know, characters and life experiences in your novels that are maybe experiences that you don't share. And that it can be um, your know, race, ethnicity, language, gender presentation, uh, sexual orientation, mental illness. It's, it's really anything where you feel like if folks from that community are reading it, they would feel uh, marginalized, maligned by what you wrote, that you are not writing it um, from a place of, um, of, of true knowledge and research. And it is extremely labor intensive. So sensitivity readers, as long as they feel comfortable, sensitivity readers should always be paid by the person who's hiring them because they have to go through, they have to catch things that are offensive. They have to share it with you and have conversations. So there's a huge burden there. So they should always be paid for their time. And oftentimes I've found that like just the process of working with them, it's wonderful because you, uh, your characters are fuller. You are also, I mean, you're just like knowing more folks in your community. You're like knowing more readers, meeting more authors. Um, uh, I think just being a more active member of your community. So that's why I think it's it works on a number of levels. Uh, we've often found sensitivity readers within our community. Sometimes there are Facebook groups where folks will say, um, you know, I'm a Japanese American. I'm available. I love sensitivity reading. Please approach me. Uh, there are also websites online that you can Google and they have like almost like databases where folks are listing the communities that they're a part of. And then you can kind of say like, I would love to like pay you to look at my manuscript. Just hearing Catherine and Crystal um, talk about creating worlds where, you know, they have um, black and BIPOC uh, characters in their books. And I'm just curious how you guys go about um, casting those, you know, like is it a single narrator or two narrators? And is it usually like a white person voicing these other voices? Or, or do you ever hire a black, um, you know, narrator to do your white voices? Like, just curious. Yeah, that's a good question. Like Crystal, I've not been able to have much of a hand in the casting process besides um, providing the descriptions of the characters to the uh, audiobook creators who have taken the story. Um, I ha do have a book with um, with a black main character, and so when they bought my book, I said I made sure to tell them like, please hire you know a black uh, audiobook narrator, you know, for Henry's part, and that was really important to me. But everything that you, that, um, you folks have been talking about has made me start to think about because there are usually with romance it's two narrators, and so if we have diverse folks in our books, I don't think that the audiobook is like bringing in. Um, diverse folks to fill in the side character roles. Multicast is normally where you would have one person per character if they've got, you know, a big enough role. But more than likely, um, Ebony's question might be more geared toward a single POV narration where, you know, she would be cast as narrating the entire book. Um, even though there is a side character in there who may be a person of color, but she can take on narrating every character in that book. Uh, so that, again, is something that, you know, should be looked into as it goes back to offering, um, uh, having the opportunities 
available for people to narrate books that are not just based on somebody's um, somebody's cultural background or ethnicity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, is it enough to that the character is written as white? Does that does if 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 a white narrator can vo- voice black characters in a white book, mm-hmm. then can't the same be true for a black narrator voicing white characters right. in a white book? I know. And mm-hmm. you know what? And the, yeah. and it all boils down to again like, people's <laughs> perception of what general American sounds like, or mm-hmm. this person sounds black. They don't sound like my character who's from you know, uh, Minnesota, you know, what Mm -hmm. have you. So again, it's, it's a mindset of us not thinking we all have different voices. I've worked New York audiobook industry the first four, five years of my, my industry. I've literally seen it all. And the worst thing that I've seen to date, and it still irks me and I still hear the voices in my head sometimes I'm hearing them right now is when you get a white narrator and it's a book that has people from all over or even if it's just black and white or just black and Latino or Latinx it's that they go and they go with this farce farcical overboard kind of character so if you notice if you're if you're afraid as an author to hire a black person or a Asian person or a Spanish speaking person to narrate your book because your character is white. But like you do, like, as you said, Catherine, you do have other characters in there. Really, you have to think about, okay, so my main character is white, but is this, am I going to find a narrator or an actor that has the skill set to execute this without it sounding like, a stereotypical big mama or, or you know like <laughs> yeah something crazy right it's supposed to be about meritocracy about your capability about your strong suits it's not if we can just get away from like what did what did people always hate hearing people that are of no color say i don't see any race like if we actually didn't see race, then nobody would care about people saying that, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, she's, Ebony's super freaking talented. Mm-hmm. Jock's super freaking talented. Catherine, you're super freaking talented. Crystal, you are as well. I do what I can. And, like, we can. <laughs> you're talented, <laughs> too. And, so, so you're very talented. Day, very talented. Let's do great work. <laughs> like, I just want to do great work. And that's what most people want to do. And you just have to think about what is going to what is going to get us to the point of creating this great r- mm-hmm. work. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, broadening the, the art that gets made here, one of the benefits that I can see is that the art that comes out of a world in which this work has been done is more diverse art. And it's art that represents the diversity of the world better so that you don't have people uh, trying to uh, change who they are to be able to see themselves in a narrative. They already have narratives out there um, that that reflect them. And it's easy for them to find uh, characters that they relate to and stories that they see themselves in. Um, and... So I, what I hope is that um, everyone can, who sees this can be open enough to hear these things and um, humble enough to hear these things and uh, are motivated to go out there and do the work to make the world that kind of place, starting with our independent audiobook community. I couldn't agree more, and I hope you do as well. So thanks for joining us on ACX University. We'll see you next time.